One, two. Good evening, this is EK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, EK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast, coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Just checking on levels there. Um, we're coming to you for, oh yes, I've already said that, from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Good evening to everybody. Trust everybody is okay. Listening 23, uh, Richard, if you're in the background, be interested to make sure the audio levels are okay. According to my vmix, I'm clipping like crazy. Um, <laughs> but I do have the AGC on, if I, I might need to uh, knock that off. Um, anyway, uh, I think everything is about right. And uh, we're streaming on YouTube. So for the visual side of things tonight, um, well every Friday night at least, uh, you can tune to my YouTube channel VK3CSJ, just look for the live symbol and uh, I might just back off the microphone a little bit. Um, and we are streaming, I can see that we are going to the internet and to the world wide web for what it's worth. Um, we're also transmitting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band. A very pleasant good evening to all the shortwave listeners there. And uh, also via the Melbourne digital repeater, HD repeater, VK3RTV. Good evening to all the viewers there. Uh, I don't believe there's any BATC feed happening. Uh, so the British Amazon Television Club server link is, uh, I suspect, down. And um, so the... Oh, it is, is it? Thank you for that. Um, I shall um, knock that down. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that should be a bit better. Uh, let me know if that's a bit better. Uh, um, hello, if I speak up a little bit. But no, it's, it's just clipping into the red, so that might be all right. Uh, it's YouTube, it's always a concern. Um, anyway, where was I? Um, good evening to everybody on the Discord uh, channel as well, <laughs> if you can call it a channel. Uh, very pleasant good evening to Cassiopeia, uh, Martin. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, VK7JAH, Martin. And uh, we've got Mitch, VK3 Zulu Tango, tuning in tonight. Uh, he says um, he's trying out his NFED 80 meter antenna tonight. He said, was that you doing all that tuning up, I wonder? <laughs> um, he says, uh, I'm able to overcome the S9 noise floor. And uh, five minutes from one thaggy. And uh, hopefully it was not wasted. Oh, it wouldn't have been wasted, mate. And uh, proof of the pudding. Yep, just reading your sentence. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, and a very pleasant good evening to uh, Richard, VK3VRS. Streaming on Discord is live. So he's tr actually streaming the visions on the Discord TV side of things, which you can view there. And uh, Steve, Mr. SPX. And uh, your YouTube is freezing down here. Now I probably haven't got much, I can't probably do too much about that. Um, that's something about your internet, I think, rather than me streaming. But it could be my end, I don't know. Uh, but I'll, um, uh, I, I know that uh, the RF can affect the modem downstairs, but uh, hopefully we can get through this next hour without uh, too many issues. 
Uh, what else is there? We've also got an email address, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com. And uh, I can see that we have uh, Mr. VCL there. And he says, um, appears we have uh, signal frequency. Yeah, I think it was just tuning up. That's all that I think that was. Uh, yeah, all right. Okay. Read that a bit more later on, I think. Anyway, I'm speaking very softly into the microphone, but I can see I've got lots of gain on here, so um, hopefully I won't sneeze or anything like that. Um, anyway, we're uh, into a new month, the 3rd of November, and uh, the year is almost over. Uh, how quick it has gone, I can't believe it. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, the ASV, Founded in 1922, has well over 1,600 members throughout the various states of Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy in its various forms. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, with the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Moolia Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The monthly meetings are also televised uh, on the ASV's YouTube channel if you can't make it into Melbourne. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux containing news articles, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and there's also a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan in the telephone loan scheme ASV has. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote there are a range of instruments available for members to use. Uh, the uh, two larger ones with appropriate training, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the side is a 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope, which can be accessed via involvement with the Radio Astronomy Group. A very pleasant good evening to any RAS members that may be listening, I really don't get too much feedback from those guys these days. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same thing. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities. In fact, I'm going to, tonight I'm going to go through that list instead of just summarising, just to fill in a bit of time. So let me just go there and to sections. Uh, okay, just go back one. That'll do. So we have in alphabetical order uh, astrophotography, uh, club section, comet and meteor section, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics section, deep sky. Historical section, instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, new astronomers group, radio astronomy, solar astronomy, space exploration, and women in the ASV. 
So if you go to the website at www.asv.org.au and look under the sections tab, you'll find uh, that list of various activity groups. You click on those uh, headers and uh, will open up to a general description of the section and contact details for the section directors. So if you wish to, you don't have to be a, a member to uh, pop in on a meeting. Just like, like I say, just uh, um, send an email to, or contact the section director and request uh, as, a, as a visitor to be able to sit in and see whether it interests you and um, yeah, see if it's uh, something to, uh, to come back to. And then, uh, then you can look at uh, perhaps becoming a member, which is all done by the homepage and all done by uh, PayPal. Um, yeah, so they're the various sections that make up the ASV. Uh, we also have regional sections. Uh, there's the ASV in Bendigo, and the ASV in Heathcote, and the ASV in Shepparton, <laughs> more or less. Um, but uh, the, the Bendigo Astronomical Society uh, District Bendigo District Astronomical Society became a section, uh, an official section of the ASV merged a few years ago. So Bendi the ASV Bendigo section is still uh, as as a uh, an astronomical group is still uh, churning along with their famous sidewalk astronomy uh, activities. And um, I can see there's a mention of me there too on a Friday night. That's it's cool. Uh, then there's ASV Heathcote. Um, they mentioned that talk about Heathcote City, and uh, yeah, just explore that anyway on the ASV website. And uh, yes, so like I say, and it looks like um, the Sea Link, Sea Lake Astro. It's a bit hard to read it, but that session booked out across the screen. But anyway, there was an Astro Fest coming up this weekend I think and uh, that's all been booked out so once again the the popularity of that particular event has uh, taken hold and um, looks like it's um, doing very well uh, November 4 yeah so all very good I hope they have good weather it looks like it's going to be good weather this weekend so it should be pretty good you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there, I think. And uh, like I say, any further information about the society, uh, just go to the website www.asv.org.au. Um, 80 is good at the moment. Thanks, Martin. Righto, Mr. Brash. Now, because it is the beginning of the month, we have Tamatha, um, not Tamatha, or we do have a, a video report from Tamatha a little later on, um, but uh, what I was going to go to was the Sky Notes uh, from Tanya Hill, the resident astronomer at uh, the planetarium and uh, sky notes for november 2023 now she starts off by talking about um comet rosetta uh, so it's a couple of images here that she's got there is a video but i can't no, I, I couldn't um it wasn't a youtube video uh, it's actually something belongs to the uh, ESA to the um, European Space Agency and those videos are a little bit difficult to copy or not so much copy but download um, so I haven't bothered with it <laughs> suffice to say there should be enough in the text here to do the job um, all right so sky notes for November 23 this will probably take us to half past 10 uh, landing on a comet she says Tanya Hill Almost 10 years ago this month, the first landing occurred on the core or nucleus of a comet, a 3.4-kilometre uh, size comet, 67P, Shuryumov-Juraskimenko. 
I wouldn't know if that's how it's pronounced, but anyway, it sounds a bit like it. Issa, Little Lander Philly, detached from the probe Rosetta to attempt a controlled landing. Its harpoons failed to deploy to give it a secure footing. Philly rebounded and bounced and floated in the low gravity before it finally came to rest in a, in a crevice in the surface of the comet. Limited data was received from the lander before it went into hibernation. Unable to recharge its batteries since the solar panels were in sunlight for only a short period of time. Philly has been silent ever since. Rosetta's own extended mission ended two years later on the 9th of September 2016. It was slowly brought to a gentle impact on the comet, sending images up to the last few seconds. And that's the video that they have here showing a kind of uh, mosaic of um, the last few images. But I, it was just a bit difficult to get that into the vMix, so I didn't worry about it. But what they do have here is a fixed image or a still shot of Rosetta, which is exhausting gas and particles streaming from it. This is taken 28 kilometers kilometers away from the probe, uh, from the, the actual uh, comet. Um, having said that, uh, however, detailed images from the parent ship Rosetta overhead revealed the comet to be a twin lobed two smaller bodies joined by a narrow neck which you can see in the image there on the screen. It was numerous bright water ice patches on the surface. It saw numerous bright water ice patches on the surface and pits venting material from the subsurface as the comet is heated by the sun, which you can see there. The jets carrying gas and dust particles outward creating a diffuse coma around the nucleus and long tails pointing away from the sun by pressure of the solar wind. And uh, again in that image there is the active core of Comet 67P. Uh, as it vents gas and dust into space as observed from 28 kilometers away. The comet is a low density porous aggregate of grains, dust and water ice with an angular hard crusty surface. Its surface seems darkened by eons of solar exposure. In some particularly dusty areas there are Cinematic dune like ripples and boulders with trailing tails. Such effects may be caused by a combination of the comet's rotation, its low gravity, and jets venting sideways along the surface. Inside it may be up to 85% empty space. And here is a, another image of that close up. And they say that this is a Rosetta view of the comet from a distance of 16 kilometers. Rocks as small as 60 centimeters are piled beside larger angular outcrops in this image. Comet 67P orbits the Sun every six and a half years on an elliptical path that takes it from beyond Jupiter to inside Mars. Each time it moves sunward it loses ice and dust. Eventually it may evolve into an inert rubble pile not unlike some small low density asteroids in the inner solar system. The comet may have once been two bodies that gently joined but if cracks in its narrow neck grow it may split apart and become two again. And there's another image here we've got a little bit closer. And uh, so in that image there, you've, it's um, it's definitely closer. 2.7 kilometers, in fact, from 2.7 uh, kilometers, Rosetta's um, 
Azaris Azaris Osiris that's it Osiris camera located in Philly inside a dark crevice which uh, with one of its three legs in sunlight so in that right part of the, the screen which is covered by my text there on the screen um, you can see the probe being uh, covered by other rocks and features blocking the solar cells from getting sunlight but you can see it sitting in there photographed by Rosetta's uh, Osiris camera so it's pretty interesting they, they, they've been able to get these images and land on a comet <laughs> pretty stunning stuff really uh, okay now we continue on with the rest of um, Tanya Hill's uh, sky notes um, let's bring up the camera again still sky uh, still video streaming I keep an eye on that she also explores um, she also has one two three four five six six links on her sky notes uh, page to uh, more information about Rosetta um, so if you want to know more information on that uh, okay Melbourne's sun times uh, on Wednesday the 1st of November we had sunrise at 6.13 a.m. sitting at 7.54 with the average day length of 13 hours and 40 minutes on Saturday the 11th of November sunrise will be at 6.03 a.m. setting at 8.04 with the day length being four, just over 14 hours by Tuesday the 21st of November sunrise will be at 5.56 a.m. setting at 8.15 the day length will be 14 hours 19 minutes and by the end of November, Thursday the 30th, the sunrise will be at 5.52, setting at 8.25, with the day extending out to 14 hours and 32 minutes. So our days get just that little bit longer. Moon phases. On the Sunday, the 5th of November, there will be a third quarter. On Monday the 13th, there will be a new moon by Monday the 20th it will be a first quarter phase and by the end of the month on the 27th of November Monday will be a full moon on Tuesday the 7th the moon will be at lunar apogee furthest from the earth at 404,569 kilometers and by Wednesday the 22nd the moon will be at lunar perigee closest to the earth at 369,818 kilometers now a quick breakdown of what's happening with our solar system as far as the planets go if you're interested in catching up with the planets uh, Mercury the speedy planet orbiting closest to the Sun has passed behind the Sun for solar conjunction but is yet to reappear in our night skies Venus the bright morning star can easily be seen in the pre-dawn light from around 4 a.m. before fading by sunrise Mars the red planet is about to journey behind the Sun for its solar conjunction and is not visible in November Jupiter having been bright in opposition on the opposite side of Earth to the Sun this giant planet continues to be seen in the evenings from 8 p.m. in the northeast it will move across the north, north and set in the northwest around 4 a.m. you uh, may have noticed that it's a fairly obvious uh, um, planet in the sky at night it's quite bright and uh, 
definitely got one look to look for in a pair of good binoculars or a telescope. Saturn, the faint and yellowish ringed planet is visible from 9pm high in the northwest before setting in the west by 2.30am, also quite visible. Meteors, what's happening with meteors this month? Meteors. November has two meteor showers, the Taurids and the Leonids. Very popular, the Leonids. Uh, and in good dark skies, up to 10, 15 meteors could be seen. The Taurids are bright, slow moving with colourful fireballs and occur in the first week of November in the constellation of Taurus the Bull near the Pallades star cluster and also near the red star Aldebaran. So that's the radiant look towards t the constellation of Taurus the Bull and you'll see um, uh, up to 10-15 meteors an hour. Taurids. The Leonids are high speed meteors that leave trains lasting several minutes. They appear in Leo, the lion, which rises around 4 a.m. in the northeast from the 13th to the 20th, but their peak on the but they peak on the morning of the 18th of November. Just check the day. 18th of November is Saturday. Yeah, which is good. So if you're a keen meteor scatter operator, uh, you can turn your beams to the north or to the west and listen out for distant uh, two metre beacons or 70 centimetre beacons mostly two metre beacons, six metre beacons and just sit on their frequency and once a meteor burns in the atmosphere you'll hear a, a ping um, lasting only a few seconds but uh, as soon as you hear that sort of sound you can go up on the calling frequency and call CQ on VHF and work stations thousands of kilometres away in the space of five seconds <laughs> Uh, it's been ages since I've done that but it was good fun but I think the thing that's really really interesting is to be able to hear the ping the the reflection of the signal coming from that distant low-powered beacon it's always interesting to hear that anyway uh, so the Toids um, and the Leonids this month uh, they also say here that um, the, the Leonids are high-speed meteors that leave trains lasting several minutes. They appear in Leo, which is rising about 4 a.m. So it's a morning thing, <laughs> uh, an early morning uh, event. And they peak on the morning of the 18th, yes. They arise from particles left by Comet Temple Tuttle. Uh, as it orbits the sun every 33 years, the Earth goes through its debris field every mo every 12 months. But the number of Leonid meteors have been declining over recent years, and perhaps only 15 per hour. All right, going on to constellations, stars and constellations. In the north, looking towards the north. The constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse, is in the north this month with an Andromeda low in the northwest. Aquila, the eagle and its principal star Alta, is in the northwest. Low in the north this month is the Andromeda galaxy, M31. The furthest object visible to the naked eye at 2.5 million light years. This large spiral galaxy contains perhaps one trillion stars and takes up an area in the sky larger than the moon. So even even if you're in a dark sky site and you can um, 
uh, find Andromeda by eye, you probably wouldn't be able to see it directly looking at it, but by offsetting your vision, because uh, our eyes are a little bit more sensitive at the side, uh, you'll probably be able to just see uh, the faint glow of um, Andromeda. But if you had a camera attached to a telescope, which I'm close to doing, <laughs> My, uh, one of my challenges here in Narriwar in South is to be able to photograph um, Andromeda from low on the horizon. But as they say here, the, the full size of Andromeda takes up the size of the moon in the sky, which is pretty big. But you just can't see it because the light is so faint. The beauty of CCD cameras. Anyway, that's another story. Um, okay, so there it is. Um, in the west, if we turn our chairs and look to the west, uh, Spectacular Scorpius is now in the west. The red star uh, Antares, Alpha Scorpii, it sits uh, at the middle of the three stars that form the, uh, the body of the scorpion. Yeah. Sagittarius, the centaur archer, is above its bow and arrow, forming the well-known teapot asterism. And further up sits Capricorn, the sea goat, the strange goat with the tail of a fish. So this is where you've got to be familiar with stars in the sky, the constellations. For those folks that just get out there at night time at 9 o'clock to have a cigarette, and just look up at the sky and think if it looks at the sky in awe it's, you're just looking at a bunch of stars but <laughs> but you know if you've got an interest in the sky and uh, as a, from, a, from a boyhood type time you, you become familiar with the, the shape of the stars as such and the constellations and the pictures that they generate so these constellations stand out like Orion the constellation of Orion is a very obvious one you can't mistake the teapot and all that. So, you know, um, it's this sort of stuff that you're, you're able to pick out when you become familiar with constellations, and there's a lot of books on it. In fact, the, I know I've mentioned this before, uh, but uh, if you've got a, a smartphone, um, I'll do it again. The uh, <coughs> I've, There's an app, there's two apps, in fact, there's probably several apps. But uh, there's an app you can install, which is in this case I've got uh, Star Tracker, and if, for those watching TV at the moment, that's Star Tracker. You can see how amazing the as I move the phone around, you can see how absolutely how quick the the star patterns in the sky are updating millisecond by millisecond, microsecond by microsecond the computing power there in my hand is amazing but that my phone is facing east from where I am here sitting in front of my camera I'm I'm basically facing due east and so that's that's looking at the constellations and stars that are on the horizon as I speak you can actually just see Scorpio there on the horizon right now in that image isn't that amazing stuff? I, I just think the technology behind all that is just amazing stuff. As a as a young kid, I'm 63 now, but I grew up using star charts, bits of bloody paper that you'd fold out and you'd you'd have to try and smooth out flat because the creases were <laughs> causing problems with your viewing. So. <laughs> But you used to look you go out at nine o'clock at night because that's when the chart was set for nine o'clock at night in the evening and you you'd hold this chart up like that above your head and you go, Oh oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, it's about right <laughs> But now you've got this this marvelous stuff and there's there's music being played here too. There's a very, very um, astronomical type music being played. So isn't that cool? Anyway, enough of that rubbish. Well, it's not rubbish, it's bloody fantastic. I'll just let that sit there for a minute and flatten the battery. G'day Kim, VK5FUSE has joined the chat window. <laughs> and Dave, our resident Mount Burnett uh, astronomer. 
All right. So that was um, talking about that. If we turn to the east, which we were just a moment ago with our super foam, in the east, Orion, the hunter, rises late in the evening this month. I was just there talking about it. One foot being the blue giant star regal, Beta Orionis, and a shoulder, and the red giant star Betelgeuse, or Betelgeus, I think it's another way of saying that, uh, Alpha Orionis. The bird stars known as the Orion's Belt are uh, Al Nitik, uh, Al Nilum, and Mittaka, I think that's how you pronounce those, and form the base of the saucepan teapot asterism, while Orion's scabbard, the sword, the saucepan's handle in this case, <laughs> hanging from its belt contains uh, in its center the beautiful Orion nebula. This is probably one of the most photographed parts of the sky uh, because the Orion nebula is a region where stars are being born uh, as we speak. There's also a pulsar that sits somewhere amongst all that. Um, but the imagery that you can get uh, from sticking a camera onto a telescope and looking in that region of the sky, I, I'm, I am forever blown away by the images that amateur astronomers are taking. On Facebook alone, there's several pages, several uh, Facebook pages dedicated to um, astronomy, to uh, astrophotography, not to mention the ASV's astro astrophotography group. And uh, everybody's putting up pictures. Every now and then they stick up these pictures and it's just uh, ama amazing stuff to uh, what can be done with a little bit of patience. Uh, okay, so uh, where was I with all that? Um, <clears throat> we're talking about the Orion Nebula, a vast gas cloud 1300 light years away where stars f uh, formation is occurring. I just said that. Note that the Orion, the, the, uh, note that Orion appears upside down in the southern hemisphere. I think that's hardly worth mentioning that, Tanya. Um, for all us folks that live for most of our lives in the southern hemisphere, we know how the Orion looks in the sky. <laughs> in, the, in the northern hemisphere, it's the wrong way up. So it's the right way up here. Um, just being funny. Also, upside down is Taurus the bull. I, I can feel that, me being a Taurus. With the red giant star Antares, uh, using the north the east later in the night. In the southeast, past Orion is Kansas Major, a greater dog, and its star Cirrus, Alpha Kansas Majoris, uh, the brightest star visible at night and also referred to as the dog star. Also, uh, so approaching some of the night sky from the northeast to the southwest will include a diverse range of features to enjoy, she says. I don't particularly care if this takes me for the rest of the, the whole hour. That's what I like about Sky Notes. It's a, it's a really long thing to, to work my way, way through. Uh, in the south, if we turn our chairs to the south, <coughs> low in the south this month is Crux, Southern Cross, uh, with the two pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri, to its right in the constellation Centaurus, in the southeast shines the second brightest star at night, Canopus, Alpha Carni, Carni, Carni. Don't worry about it. The principal star of the constellation of Carina the Keel. Uh, the broad band of the Milky Way arcs from southeast along the western horizon to the northeast, something that stands out very clearly in dark skies. During the night, as the Earth rotates to the east, it will wheel across the sky so that by 3 a.m. it will stretch from west to east, right across the sky, as we look towards the centre of our galaxy, of the galaxy. The International Space Station orbits every 90 minutes at the average distance of 400 kilometres above the Earth. Uh, here in Melbourne, there are 
uh, well, she's got two passes. Uh, what's, uh, yeah, okay. In the morning, on the 24th of November, uh, Friday morning, the 24th of November, there's a pass at 4:38 a.m. to 4:43 a.m. northwest to southeast. And then in the morning of Monday the 27th, there's a passing at 3.48 a.m. to 3.51 a.m. north northwest to southeast. At that time of the morning, though, at 3.48, even at 4.38 a.m., I wouldn't think you'd see it um, because it would be in the shadow of the earth. So I don't, I don't know whether you'd really see those passes visually. Uh, in the evening, only two passes occur in, in the evening this month, on the 1st and the 2nd, uh, but neither of them are bright enough to see. Anyway, there are many more other passings. You can go to heavensabove.com. Uh, Heavens Above gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites, live sky views, 3D visualizations, and uh, be sure to first enter your location in the configuration file to make it accurate for you where you are. Heavensabove.com Heavens Above. Alright, keeping an eye on my time now. On this day, well not quite, but on the 1st of November 1963, the first, <laughs> just reading ahead, on the 1st of November 1963 would have been a really great day for a lot of people. Uh, anyway, on the 1st of November 1963, when the largest radio telescope, the Puerto Rico Arecibo Observatory, opens, utilizing a natural valley and transceivers suspended from pylons on nearby peaks. What a structure that was. I really, really wish I, I had have had the chance to visit that uh, before it collapsed. On the 3rd of November 1957, Laika, a three-year husky Samoy dog, became the first animal into orbit on Sputnik 2. Uh, while never intended to return to Earth, she expired from heat stress after only a few hours. That's the good old Russians for you. Um, <laughs> on the third of, also on the, um, that's interesting. Now I'm not too sure about these dates. Yeah, she's got that that one about the husky dog. Uh, she's got the th it's 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 the third, but she hasn't written it R D. It's N D. I reckon that was meant to be the second. On the second of 1957, a three-year-old husky Samoyed dog became the first animal, because the next date is the third, and that's three R D, as in uh, third. <laughs> oh dear. On the 3rd, 1973, Mariner 10 launches to Mercury, the first probe to use a gravitational slingshot around a planet to reach an objective. In this case, it was Venus. On the 4th of uh, November, 2003, the largest solar flare recorded causes blackouts, radio blackouts, and saturates satellites, and was associated with a, pardon me, coronal mass ejection many times larger than Earth, leaving the Sun at 2,300 kilometers an hour. On the 8th of November 1656, the birth of second astronomer royal, Edmund Haley, who calculated several historical comets to be the same, um, he successfully predicted a, its regular 76-year return, uh, which carries his name. On the 9th of November 1934 was the birth of American astrophysicist and science communicator Mr. Carl Sagan. On the 12th of November 2014, first landing on a comet and direct surface images of comet um, uh, um, um, P67. <laughs> No, that's not it. What was it again? 67P. I can't pronounce the German. 67P, that'll do. 
because um, the German names are just unpronounceable. And uh, I'll just one more date. Um, where are we? I went ahead of myself here. Uh, oh yeah. And on the twelfth, also on the twelfth of November, nineteen eighty, Voyager one has hi a historic close encounter with Saturn at 124,000 kilometers when it flew by moon Titan which precluded going to onto Uranus or Neptune although both were later visited by Voyager 2 plenty of other dates but I'll leave those till next week you're tuned to ASV radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria and thank you Steve, Mr SPX has put up an image on Discord of exactly what I was referring to before in regards to the constant, uh, the uh, nebula Orion, the Orion nebula and uh, really quite a spectacular thing thanks to Steve for putting that up um, alright, uh, this is a quick little thing it's a, it's a ask the uh, astronomer thing that astronomy.com does have ask astro they call it why is the night sky dark? The answer tells us a lot about our universe and its limitations. Uh, published October 18. The question is so common and important that it has a name. The Olbers Paradox. Olbers, O-L-B-E-R-S, Olbers Paradox. Named for 19th century astronomer Henrik Olbers Henrik Olbers Henrik um, though the question had been asked for centuries prior the idea is this if the universe is infinite and full of stars then no matter where you look our line of sight should fall on a star and the night sky should be bright instead of dark but this is not the case and the answer actually tells us a lot about the universe and its limitations the key to this problem is that the universe is not infinitely old we know that it is only about 13.7 billion years old and it has been expanding for that entire time the stars in the universe have only had 13.7 billion years to be born, evolve and die. So the universe is not only actually filled with stars at every location for us to see. Additionally, light from the stars that do exist needs time to reach us. We can only see light that has had enough time since the beginning of the universe to travel from its origin to Earth. Furthermore, as the universe expands, light travelling towards us from distant sources undergoes a process called Doppler shifting, which stretches the light to longer wavelengths. Given a large enough shift, the light is no longer visible to the human eye, and in fact, the oldest radiation we can see in the universe, the cosmic microwave background, has been stretched by a factor of about 1000 so that it appears much cooler and at much longer wavelengths than when it was produced and this radiation though it is everywhere is invisible to the naked eye ultimately the nature of the universe itself expanding evolving with an infinite age or finite age are the reasons we do not see light all around us and the night sky appears dark <coughs> you're tuned to ASV radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel um, okay this is uh, should be a quick article there's a picture here I can bring up of Titan and let's see if I can also include my insert no, there we are. That's it. Good. A little article on Titan. Why Titan should be on humanity's must-visit list. Saturn's 
largest moon has vast resources and atmosphere and the potential for safe habitation. When it comes to worlds for humans to visit, Titan may not naturally jump to the top of any travels agency's list. This frigid moon of Saturn has an average temperature of minus 181 degrees Celsius. Surface water doesn't flow. It's locked away in ice that acts as the world's crust. But Titan also has advantages for astronauts looking for a long-term getaway. The world's thick atmosphere makes it in some ways a moderate environment for human habitats and its vast hydrocarbon resources make it a potentially lucrative prospect as well. But more than this, Titan is a prime candidate for scientific exploration, including the potential discovery for extraterrestrial life, which could be even more alien than anything found on Mars. Although I don't think they've found anything on Mars yet. So in this image you're seeing on the screens right now, on YouTube and in the repeater, this is a picture of Titan. Titan's dense atmosphere, dark blue, extends hundreds of miles above the world's surface, as seen in this false colour mosaic captured by the Cassini spacecraft. Titan is the only world in the solar system known to harbour liquids at its surface. This is thanks to the fact that it also uh, also the only known moon in this or any planetary system to have a sizable atmosphere. At 4.4 times the density of Earth's and 1.5 times the atmospheric pressure of the surface of this gaseous layer of nitrogen and methane shields the liquids on its surface. Owing to the cryogenic cold, those liquids are primarily hydrocarbons like ethane and methane, ethane and methane. This dense atmosphere also helps to negate the worry of the omnipresent on atmospheric deserts like Mars or the Moon that your blood will boil off if the wall of your habitation unit were somehow to be punctuated or punctured. Punctuated, punctured. This thick atmosphere also helps block out harmful interstellar cosmic rays, like most emitted by distant supernovas that threaten astronauts on more barren worlds like Mars. This benefit alone adds significant value to Titan as a potential second home for hu humanity. It stops cold the it, it stops cold the runway train of unwanted genetic damage which in many ways is a bigger threat to life than the potential harms of living in reduced gravity for long time sorry for long term destinations mars is just not a very good place says planetary scientist amanda hendricks formerly of nasa's jet propulsion laboratory and currently of the planetary science institute in Tucon, Arizona. Chief among the challenges Hendrix foresees is that cosmic rays present not only a long-term cancer risk, but a significant danger to human brain matter in the short term. Evidence is mounting that even NASA's planned short-term research trips to Mars could pose dangerous radiation exposure risks to the astronauts involved. Hendrix argues that Titan is a much more valuable option in the long run since it has a protective atmosphere overhead. Going to Mars is a good stepping stone, says Hendrix. It's a good, accompli it's a good accomplishment to go for. Go to Mars, check it out and come back. But she says Titan offers so much more opportunity for safe habitation. She calls it the most Earth-like place in the solar system. Alright, I'll leave that article there, but that's that's um, uh, that's courtesy of astronomy.com and uh, I think Titan, if they can get, they've already um, I think landed a probe on Titan, but yeah, I think that place is definitely worth exploring a bit more using a probe at least at this stage. 
All right, I can see it's coming up to 5-2. It's really quick how that hour's gone. It just amazes me. Um, I've got a few things here too, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll bring up Tanya. Um, not Tanya. <laughs> Tamitha. Tamitha, Tanya. And uh, we'll go with... Um, with um, the latest report. Now, this latest report um, came out a few days ago, but it's, it covers today and tomorrow, Saturday. So it's, it's what Tamitha is talking about is sort of current uh, on the latest solar report. So uh, let me see. I'll, I'll have to knock down my audio levels because it'll be too loud. So stand by for Tamitha Scove's, Scove's solar report. We have some fast solar wind, a glancing solar storm blow, and some busy active regions are about to rotate into Earth view. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week definitely picks up an activity. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, your eyes can't help but be drawn to region 3673 and wait for it. Bam! Right there. Did you see that? That was a massive solar storm launch. In fact, it actually affected several different filaments in the region. The coronagraphs show this massive partial halo. In fact, you can actually see what looks like part of that blast wave. That looks like it's actually going to be a solar storm that is affecting Earth just a skosh. So we could get a couple bumpy rides here over the next couple days. Also, when we take a look at the big blast wave, you can see that it actually affected several different filaments on uh, the Earth-facing disk. So we are keeping our eyes on some of these filaments now because they may go unstable, especially near this massive coronal hole. On top of that, we're also dealing with region 3474. This region over the past couple days has just begun to really act up. It's definitely becoming a big flare player, so we're keeping our eyes on that as well. On top of that, we're also dealing with some fast solar wind from this coronal hole. We are definitely getting some, some decent aurora at high latitudes. We've even had a skosh of aurora down at mid-latitudes. It's not been lasting all that long, but uh, we're expecting to get the influence from this over the next day or two before things calm down. So aurora photographers, uh, definitely if you're at high latitude, you're going to continue to get a show, but, uh, even through Halloween. But as we move into the beginning of the new month, things should be calming down a little bit for you. Now switching to our sun's far side, we can no longer use stereo A imagery to give us a view of the sun's far side, so we have to simulate it by looking at HMI and AIA imagery of about two weeks ago to get an idea of what's going on in the solar disk. Well, look, taking a look at all that, we've got regions 3463, 3464, and believe it or not, there's a little teeny tiny region right there. Do you see that? I'm going to stop this so you can see it. This teeny tiny region doesn't look like much here. In fact, it never even got a designation before it rotated to the sun's far side. Well, that little region has continued to grow all the way during its far side passage. And as we end up taking a look at HMI uh, helioseismology far sided viewing stuff from JSOC, you can see that new region right here next to region 3460 and 3463. Look at that dark region. Everything here on the gold, that is far sided sun. And you can even see a dark patch here near region 3469. So as we take a look at 3469, sure enough, this region was also growing. In fact, you start seeing it flaring a little bit. So those regions that were just beginning to grow, they are definitely the ones that are developing on the far side, and they should be rotating into view here within the next couple days, uh, possibly about uh, two to three days for region 3460 and, and 63, and then about four days for region 3469. So 
uh, at Get Ready Amateur Radio Operators and Emergency Responders, we're going to start seeing that flare risk rise, and it looks like radio propagation is definitely going to continue to stay in the good range. Now switching to our moon, we are coming out of a full moon on our way to a third quarter. And by the fourth, the moon will still be about 58% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, you're going to have this bright companion. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are still getting that fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone. At high latitudes, we're expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of a major storm in through Halloween, and then things will begin to settle down as we move into the 1st of November. And by the weekend, we should easily be back at mostly calm conditions. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, you still could get a bit of a chance for aurora. Now mid latitudes, well, we're still only expecting expecting unsettled conditions, but now we only have about a 20% chance of active conditions over the next couple days. Things will then, of course, settle down quite quickly and we'll be back to uh, mo mostly calm conditions, if not completely calm conditions, by the end of the weekend. Now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with a few big flare players on the Earth-facing disk, especially region 3474. This is why our solar flux is sitting in the 140s right now, and that will likely continue to rise as the new regions rotate into Earth view at the end of this week. NOAA is giving us about a 25% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and again, that's going to last over the next few days, with that risk possibly rising to about a 35% as these new regions rotate into Earth view. We are sitting at minor noise on the bands right now and that's likely going to continue to stay. We even have a small risk for X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout, but that's likely going to remain low even as we move in through the weekend. Now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything continues to be in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. That is uh, at flight level 360 for you aviators. And this is the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We only have about a 5% chance of big radiation storms that's at the S1 to S2 level and likely that those conditions will continue over the rest of this week. It possibly might rise a little bit especially as region 3474 rotates to the west limb but overall the risk is going to stay pretty low so you frequent flyers and this does include air crew well everything seems to be uh, pretty good for you and so you should be all in the clear. So the space weather this week is definitely staying on the active side. We do have the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could continue to get a show easily over the next 24 hours or so before things begin to calm down, which should make your Halloween quite a happy one. But as we move into the 1st of November and early into the week, things should definitely be settling down quite a bit. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you guys are dealing with you know, minor noise on the bands right now. Things are getting a bit more noisy, especially with region 3474. Plus, we have those new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. So definitely expect to get a bit more noise on the bands and possibly uh, R1 to R2 level radio blackouts easily over this week and possibly into next as well. And now you GPS users, well, we have a little bit of issue, especially at high latitudes with the aurora ongoing, but that's going to settle down here pretty soon. But the main issue is going to be these radio blackouts as they begin to increase. So be sure to take or be a stay vigilant near dawn and near dusk, and your GPS reception should stay pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. All right, thank you, Timothy. <coughs> uh, where are my levels? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Uh, I think that's uh, okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. There's such a big, big difference in levels coming off the computer at the moment. I, I, I haven't, I haven't gone investigating the reason for it. That's that's why there's so much noise on that. Normally there isn't. Um, her her recordings are spot on. Uh, and and normally I, I don't have any 
any problems in uh, in playing that across but uh, I don't know something's changed oh, my headphones are in the way here um, uh, something's changed in the system here I, I know I say that every Friday and I don't do anything about it until <laughs> the next, next Friday so uh, I, I must uh, do something because it, uh, it what I'm hearing in, in the, I, I listen to the uh, audio off um, the monitor on the on the HF radio and I, 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 I try to have the levels adjusted so that it's um, uh, not bulk distortion, but I can also hear this, all this no noise in the background, so it's uh, not good. Anyway, the uh, I'm still streaming, which is good. <laughs> I haven't dropped out, which is uh, the main thing. So I hope you enjoyed the Timothy Scove's uh, solar report. And uh, now we go just quickly to uh, spaceweather.com. Um, and I'll bring up the latest uh, image of the sun so that's the current disk of the sun facing uh, us at the moment so we've got uh, several solar sunspots there uh, which are in view and uh, the solar wind uh, is currently at 347 uh, kilometers a second at a density of 2.3 2 protons per cubic centimeter um, the current sunspot number is 113. The radio sun, uh, the solar flux, is currently at 158 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. The K index, K planetary K index, KP is currently 1.67, which is considered quiet. The 24-hour max KP figure is also 1.67, which is again considered as quiet. Um, the uh, aurora over the Antarctic, Antarctica is currently looking like this, uh, as you see on my YouTube channel and via the Melbourne TV repeater. So there's a there's a reasonable glow, um, which is focused uh, towards the mainland, um, but um, there, there would be only very very small cases of any auroral activity occurring, uh, I'd say. Um, and going back to that, uh, the general report is minor geomagnetic storm watch. Uh, one and perhaps two CMEs could graze Earth's magnetic field on the 4th of November. Individually, neither CME is particularly significant, but together they could spark a minor G1 class geomagnetic storm. And this is especially true if one sweeps up the other to form a cannibal. CME as they're calling it. Uh, I think that's all that's worth reporting there from what I can see. To finish off, uh, potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, as of the 3rd of November 2023 there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids but none of them are on a collision course with the Earth at the moment. Okay, having said that, um, I think we'll conclude the tonight's uh, broadcast. And uh, I did have a few other articles to go through, but it just goes to show how, how long the Scott reading the Sky Notes takes to, uh, to work its way through. Um, but um, one of the reports I was going to go through, hopefully read out, which I can leave till next week, I suppose. Um, this is courtesy of space.com. It's an article called A Chunk of the protoplanet that made the moon may be stuck near Earth's core. A debris from the impact between Earth and protoplanet eventually formed the moon. And uh, they're saying that a part of that is embedded uh, in the core of the Earth. Um, so that, that's uh, potentially interesting. Uh, the other one was groundbreaking laser communications experiment flying to the International Space Station on SpaceX cargo. This is the 5th of November. Um, it's called Luma T. Uh, could help pave the way for more efficient communications between Earth and distant destinations like Mars. Um, early this month, SpaceX will spend a clutch of science experiments to the space station investigating a range of topics from high speed laser communications to rolling atmospheric waves on Earth. Uh, so, that was another article I was going to go through. That's courtesy of space.com. And NASA, NASA has just revealed a seven-planet system hiding in old mission data. Uh, so I can leave that till next week. 
All right, having said that, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night cast missions. Uh, we're listening on 3541 kHz for any stations wishing to check in. This is VK3 EKH. Okay, we've got VK3GL, VK3TJS, VK3SBX, and there was a station just under you, Mr. SBX. Who was the other one? Okay, VK7JAH. Any others? Acknowledging VK3MAP. Any other stations? Uh, VK3, who is it again? Yep, gotcha. No worries, VK3ZT. Alright. Alright, to the top of that list, VK3GL Bunyip, VK3EKH. G'day, Graham. Thank you. 